History was made on January 14th to open the year as the WBC gave Lennox Lewis their title. He was the first British heavyweight champion since Bob Fitzsimmons in 1899, breaking an almost century-long dry spell. Still, because it was awarded and not won in battle, there was a technical shadow over Lewis casted by Riddick Bowe. On the undercard of heavy damage, Tommy Morrison looked to add the name of Carl the Truth Williams to his resume. Morrison was banging away at Williams up until the fifth where the Truth dropped Morrison with a stiff duo of rights. Morrison rose and was dropped again almost instantly. He would again beat the count and take the best Williams had to offer until taking back the momentum leading into the ninth where he stopped Williams on the ropes. A solid comeback win for the Duke. In the main event, Big George Foreman stopped Pierre Kutzer, knocking him down in the fourth and eighth rounds before referee Joe Cortez called a halt to the action. Foreman was proving that he was still a force to be reckoned with. In an event promoted as The Homecoming, the heavyweight title scene saw some engineering. Ray Mercer was matched up against Jesse Ferguson with the winner slated to get champion Riddick Bowe later in the year. Against the agenda, the boogeyman managed to outbox Mercer en route to a unanimous decision win, throwing the planned Bowe-Mercer matchup to oblivion. There were allegations that Mercer attempted to bribe Ferguson for the win mid-fight, but Mercer was cleared in the court case. Mercer and Ferguson would have a rematch on November 19th of that same year that would see Mercer avenge the loss in a controversial split decision win. Some felt that the boogeyman had beaten Mercer again and simply had his number. A pattern of sorts was emerging in which Merciless Ray appeared to struggle with 80s heavyweights while excelling against the 90s crop. So, there went Bo versus Mercer, a match that sadly never came to be. The two were roommates back in their Olympic days, and Mercer has said he used to beat up on Bo in sparring, one of which was a birthday bash. This is coming from a man who had a reputation as a sparring warrior and an all-around danger in his amateur day peak. And again, Bo was also a gym warrior. Who would have won the pro bout? It'll be addressed in a what if down the line here on Boxingpedia. In the main event, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo made light work of the faded ex-champion Michael Dokes, stopping him in the first round. Bo took a shot at Dokes despite the challenger already being down to one knee. The dirty reputation was growing. Dokes beat the count and rose to a beating from Bo. A referee stopped the fight near the end of the first as Bo battered Dokes. Dokes in his corner felt the stoppage was premature. On February 8th, Michael Moore vacated the WBO title so that he could be ranked by the three major sanctioning bodies. He got back to work against prominent 80s heavyweight and former champion James Bone Crusher Smith. Moore coasted to a unanimous decision win and looked forward to challenging for the heavyweight title. Along building some stellar momentum in or out to 1994, Oliver McCall retired former WBO champion Francesco Damiani in eight rounds. A right hand made Damiani walk away from the action, signaling he'd had enough. It was his last fight, and despite three wins before this that came after the Mercer loss, Damiani never regained form. Still, only two losses and the WBO title on his resume sounds like a good enough career to me. Being the inaugural champ will always belong to his legacy. 
Star Spangled Glory. Tony Tucker acted as a measuring stick of sorts for heavyweight greatness dating back to his war with Mike Tyson in the 80s. After being declared the new WBC champion after Riddick Bowe dumped the belt, Lewis faced off against a game Tucker who was seeking his second world title in a great display, dropping Tucker twice in the third and ninth rounds on his way to a unanimous decision win. Despite this effort against a former champion, Lewis still remained in the shadow of the unified champion, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Riddick Bo settled for Jesse Ferguson after Ray Mercer whiffed on the opportunity. In the heavyweight debate, Cinderella challenger Jesse Ferguson challenged undefeated unified champion Riddick Bo. The IBF did not have the boogeyman ranked and refused to allow the title to be defended against him. At the end of the first, Bo dropped Ferguson with a stiff left and followed with a right as the boogeyman was already down. He would beat the count and survive the round only to be stopped by a vicious combination from both seconds into the second round. It was another easy defense for heavyweight world champion, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Star Spangled Battle. Glory or battle, take your pick. Anyway, George Foreman and Tommy Morrison met to determine the winner of the vacant WBO title. Champion Riddick Bowe was on commentary for the bout. Morrison took the boxer's approach to Foreman, tagging him from the outside and picking his spots carefully. Ultimately, he won a unanimous decision and captured the title. Was it all over for Big George's comeback journey? That's another loss now for the heavyweight crown or at least a portion of it. If he had won, and if he manages to capture the IBF title before 1995, Foreman would have became the first man to win all four title belts. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise. If Foreman had won the then less prestigious WBO title, would it really have counted? Yes, of course, but would it really have? You decide. The rematch known as Only the Strong Survive saw Evander Holyfield hit the scene on his road back to the title. He lost to Big Daddy Bo. Holyfield and Stewart had engaged in a memorable, bloody war back in 1989, and the same was expected here. It wound up being a unanimous decision win for Holyfield that saw some bright spots of action. Holyfield looked to match up with Bo again later in the year. Jeepers Creepers, do we have a bizarre one on deck. Originally, Tommy Morrison was scheduled to fight Mike Williams, but Williams refused to leave his dressing room. Him, the Doughboy Tomashek, came out of the crowd as a late split-second substitute. To clarify, this was no average Joe as some believe. The man was a professional boxer in his own right. Despite this, he was full of snacks and beer from his day spectating, and it showed in his fighting style and antics. He put on a decent showing despite the announcers talking him down and the crowd booing. Tomashek had a Cinderella opportunity before him, but this ain't no Rocky movie. After, perhaps, carrying Tomashek the duration of the fight, Morrison dropped Tim in the fourth. He rose, and the bell sounded. The ringside doctor stopped the fight before the fifth round could begin, despite protests. What do you think? Tomashek was bloody, sure, but was he really unfit to continue? Were they all saving face? Was it lose-lose for the Duke? You decide. It was Morrison's first defense of the WBO strap. The focus, anyway, was the hype building around Tommy's impending bout with Lennox Lewis.
Jeepers Creepers. In the first ever heavyweight title bout in which two British-born fighters contended for the heavyweight championship, WBC champion Lennox, the Lion Lewis, took on challenger big bounce back Frank Bruno in the Battle of Britain. The build-up to the fight saw the two gun for one another's neck. Bruno insisted that Lewis was not British for fighting under the Canadian banner in the Olympics and asserted that he was a paper champion. He also claimed that no one in Britain cared about Lennox. Lewis, on the other hand, countered by stating how following his mother to Canada was out of his power and that Bruno was an Uncle Tom. He also ribbed Bruno for how he made a fool of himself by dressing up in girls' clothing. The bad blood was real between the two, despite the claims that it was only about boxing at the end of the day. When the two met in Wales, there was no love lost. Bruno took the boxer's approach and looked to nullify the monster right hand from Lewis. For the most part, he was successful, and the fight was even up until the decisive seventh. Bruno hadn't planned for Lewis's backup, the left hook. After taking a combination of short lefts and rights, Lewis exploded with a left hook that Bruno never recovered from and he battered Frank for the remainder of the round until referee Mickey Van stopped the fight as Bruno lay defenseless on the ropes. This win did well to open public opinion to the positive for champion Lennox Lewis in his home country, but to many, he was still in the shadow of opposing champion. Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. A bout was set for December between champions Tommy Morrison and Lennox Lewis. This defense was to be Morrison's tune-up and was a mere formality. In a shocker, Morrison was the one who was made easy work of in the Tulsa shootout, as he was dropped three times until the fight was stopped by referee Danny Campbell. Michael Bent was a betting underdog who would go on to drop the title to Herbie Hyde the next year, while Morrison had once again suffered a career derailing loss. How much longer could Tommy go partying hard as a prize fighter? His clout was fading but not snuffed out. Tommy Morrison beat Tommy Morrison tonight. I stayed in the middle a little bit uh, too long and got caught with some good shots. And any man over 200 pounds can hurt you. So. On the undercard of Bo Holyfield 2, rising heavyweight Jorge Luis Gonzalez stopped former Larry Holmes challenger Ronaldo Snipes in the 10th and final round. As Snipes' eyes closed over the bout, Gonzalez grew more confident or perhaps even arrogant. In the 8th, it was most apparent with Snipes' growing more aggressive with wild hooks and the Cuban giant responding by taunting his smaller foe with cries of Sinistra e ancora destro di Gonzalez. Jorge was fighting with his hands down and in complete control. The win notched him to 17 and 0. None of his fights seeing the final bell. We'll check in on Gonzalez in two years' time when he makes his first true step up in competition in an explosive affair against a former amateur rival. We'll see if he's for real. Repeat or revenge. 
friends or enemies? Bo or Holyfield? The rematch of the 1992 Fight of the Year was on and Holyfield had the opportunity to become the third man to regain the heavyweight title from the man who'd beaten him for it after Floyd Patterson and Muhammad Ali. The real deal came in with a new all-around approach and plan now trained by the legendary Emmanuel Stewart. Rather than brawl with Bo head-on as he did the first time, Holyfield would take a more disciplined approach to Bo and box him. Bo came into the fight 10 pounds heavier than their last fight and didn't look to be as sharp as he was before. The two men fought a very even fight leading to the fan man incident in round seven that sent the event into disarray. Bo's entourage made quick work of the fan man. Bo's wife passed out and the round would resume 21 minutes later. This break in the action may have ultimately cost Bo, though it did secure him the rest that observers felt he needed. Round eight would see Holyfield dominate the champion, leading Bo to become very aggressive for the remainder of the fight. Despite this, Holyfield finished the remaining round strong and the final round saw the slugfest return between the two until the final bell. Evander Holyfield was announced the winner by majority decision and the new unified lineal WBA and IBF heavyweight champion. Bo was gracious and humble in defeat. James Miller, the fan man, spent some time in the hospital before paying $200 to get off on bail for his actions. The incident won event of the year from Ring Magazine. Following the bout, Holyfield's team was unable to come to an agreement in retaining the services of Emmanuel Stewart, and they went their separate ways. The real deal also looked to have a unification bout with WBC champion Lennox Lewis, but the WBA and IBF threatened to strip him of the titles if he didn't face their mandatory Michael Moorer. Bo's camp also offered for a third fight, but again, Holyfield was warned by the WBA and IBF that he would be stripped if he accepted the offer. It's almost as if the sanctioning bodies didn't want unification. I shall return. How much shock everybody? He better know the feminine predicament he was at one point. I'm just that much uh, determined as he was the last time. Okay, I'm just still young and I'll be back. To round off 1993, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Evander Holyfield had once again climbed the heavyweight mountain and was the reigning unified, lineal WBA and IBF champion. Holyfield's initial contemplation of retirement was short-lived as he geared up to defend his crown in 1994. Our upset of the year has to go to the Boogeyman and his efforts over merciless Ray Mercer. This upset destroyed the dream match between Bo and Mercer. Michael Bench shocker over Tommy Morrison is a close second. Round of the year goes to the fifth round of Morrison Williams where the truth almost secured the win by three round stoppage. But Morrison showed tremendous heart and survived the round to go on and win the fight by stoppage. Our fight of the year is the very even Bo Holyfield rematch that also saw the fan man incident. These two were forming the best heavyweight rivalry since Ali Frazier. Louis Bruno is a close second with Louis's impressive comeback victory. The fighter of the year is the lion, Lennox Lewis. His impressive defenses of the WBC title over Tony Tucker and Frank Bruno made waves across the division, especially considering the dethroning of Riddick Bowe at the hands of Evander Holyfield. On January 28th, 
middleweight Olympic silver medalist Chris Bird made his professional debut, turned heavyweight three fights into his career, and would build an undefeated record. On February 27th in China, Mike Hercules Weaver beat Schmoke and Bert Cooper by unanimous decision. Weaver would go on to fight until 2000 where he would have his last match in a rematch against Larry Holmes where he was stopped in six rounds. He was stopped by Holmes in 12 rounds back in 1979 and again, I feel obliged to say that they're overdue a rematch considering they love fighting 21 years apart. Randall Tex Cobb at his last bout in June, winning by stoppage. Jesse the Boogeyman Ferguson would fight until 1999, facing names such as Frank Bruno, Larry Holmes, Alex Stewart, Haseem Rockman, and Andrew Galata. Ferguson had a layered career, dating back to 1983. Larry Holmes hopped on the comeback trail and won all five of his bouts. One of those wins came over Jose Ribalta, an 80s bred bout that took place in the 90s. Larry was for real when he said he was coming for those belts and he wouldn't stop. Ray Mercer had his 1993 opened and closed by the Boogeyman with the two splitting wins, albeit controversially. Mercer won his two intermediate bouts between the Ferguson fights. Michael Moore won his other three fights on the year and would head into 1994 looking to complete the story of the weight class move up by becoming a light heavyweight champion who ascended to the heavyweight crown. Could he do it? We'll see. Riddick, Big Daddy Bo faced an unexpected setback with the loss to Holyfield and would enter a dark phase of his career as he struggled to gain a shot at the titles he'd lost. Overall, 1993 was a reversal of fortune for the division. Morrison's bounce back was derailed almost instantly. Iced out Lewis was now the WBC champion and Holyfield had regained the titles from both. Michael Moore's opportunity to shine was on the horizon as he was the mandatory for Holyfield heading in to 1990.